All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you with us today. Um, we are just going to give it a minute as people are joining. Um, but in the meantime, if you'd like to just drop in the chat, one of our favorite traditions is um, where you're coming from and what was your best Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Travel Tuesday find this year? Or in any year, but really, um, what was just something that um, that you were excited to find this year, and where are you joining us from? Um, so I'm joining from DC area, and I am very excited about a portable monitor that I got to now work from home. More, <laughs> oh, very exciting. Um, so we have people joining in. Um, so. Um, if you'd like to just, as as people are joining, go ahead and, and just drop here in the chat. Um, looks like Chicago suburbs, a scooter. Oh, that's so fun. Charlottesville. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. I haven't started shopping yet. Um, some peace and quiet. Now that is priceless. <laughs> Much needed rest and sleep. I like this. I like where we're going with this. Some favorite teas. Oh, big fan. That sounds amazing. Um, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and let people continue dropping in the chat. Um, thank you for joining us today for the webinar. So engaging for the long game strategies and pivots for effective advocacy. Um, we have with us Dr. Joseph Jones. Very excited to have him with us today. Just as a quick reminder, Institute is a CAE and a CCE approved provider. So this webinar does qualify for one hour of CAE credit and one point of CCE credit. And you can request a webinar certificate by emailing us. And I'll go ahead and drop that email in the chat here. Both the recording of the webinar today and the PowerPoint will be available in the webinar and resource center on our Institute page, um, typically about 48 hours after the webinar. Um, we do ask if you have any questions, you hold those until the end, and we'll ask at that time to drop those questions in the chat. So I'm seeing a lot more interaction here in the chat. Very excited to see that. Um, we'll go ahead and give a quick introduction. So Dr. Joseph Jones is Chief of Staff to the President at Des Moines University, a medicine and health sciences university in Des Moines, Iowa. He is a former member of U.S. Senator Tom Harkin's staff and former political director for the 2008 Obama presidential campaign in Iowa and was a senior staff member with the Iowa Democratic Party. He's also taught political science and public administration classes at a local community college and currently chairs the Board of Trustees for the American Council of Young Political Leaders and was first elected to the Windsor Heights City Council in 2017. Very excited to have you with us today. So with that said, we will go ahead and turn the time over to you, Joseph. Thank you so much. And it's uh, nice to see you, CC, and everyone else from the Institute team, and uh, it's fun to be engaging at this time of year instead of summertime when I typically get to talk about these things with our friends from organizations across the country. Um, just so you know, there is an introduction slide um, that was very nicely created that uh, came out uh, a little bit jarbled uh, this afternoon. So uh, we're starting with slide two, but um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with everyone. Um, as CC said in the introduction, I'm a former Senate staffer, um, former gubernatorial staffer, former chamber staffer, uh, and now a local elected official. Uh, I work uh, as faculty for IOM in the summertime, uh, particularly at Southeast, um, and I have an academic background that's in civics education, and so I like to do research on that. I like to work and talk about the importance of all of us being more civically engaged. So I'm really excited for this conversation about government relations and I'm going to walk through five different things here uh, and you'll see that here in our agenda. First, I'm going to talk about the lay of the land and where we are politically and all of the politics and public policy that are kind of big picture uh, in people's minds right now, especially elected officials as they are considering um, the work they're going to do in 2024. I'm going to talk a little bit about civility and the importance of having good positive discourse and uh, working with folks who think differently than us, who might have different 
different values uh, and a different way of tackling problems. I'm going to mention some of the things uh, that are key takeaways that I've heard from other individuals who have been a part of my IOM classes on government relations and building alliances and wanting to make sure that I all of us as we get ready for um, the beginning of the legislative session and the beginning of Congress, um, the things that we need to remind ourselves of and remind our boards and other um, folks in our communities of as the key takeaways from those classes. I'm going to issue a couple of challenges to you, the things that I, I think might be really instructive and informative as you move forward throughout the year, and then we're going to end on some relationship building ideas, um, things that I've been a part of, things that I've heard from others, and, and things that maybe you've done yourself. So as we get ready for 2024 from a government relations standpoint, the beginning of the congressional session and legislative sessions means we've all formulated our own agendas and we have a game plan for how we're going to approach talking to our elected officials at every level. But none of it happens in a vacuum. And so I hope that this is helpful while we all navigate the full landscape of challenges and opportunities for next year. So and thinking through today's political landscape, people have many perceptions about government, uh, particularly from a national standpoint. They talk about it being dysfunctional. We hear people say that it's ineffective. Um, and it's one of those things where as we look at the things that happened in Congress uh, already this year, where we've come close to um, having a, a um, Speaker of the House ousted and then having a Speaker of the House ousted um, and then spending time uh, looking to elect a new Speaker of the House, all things that have been unprecedented. We've come close to having a government shutdown uh, and avoided it at the very last minute. And we now have a 24 hour news cycle to, to continue to deal with. And we have put ourselves into our own boxes, uh, self gerrymandering and that sort of thing. And so the work that we all do in our organizations all happen within within the sphere. The next thing to think about is Congress. With the start of Congress, you know, we I talked a little bit about the speaker um, issue. We'll now have uh, two CRs to deal with in Q1 to avoid a shutdown. And we've seen recently a lot of uh, tense moments uh, to include um, some issues where um, People were called out uh, for some of their tactics and language, and we even had some conversations about uh, whether or not there was going to be physical fighting. Um, and while comical sometimes, it actually could mean that there's you know some real issues that we are not finding ways to to confront. And this isn't new. Um, in fact, if you um, think back uh, maybe four or five years, there's a really great book called uh, The Field of Blood uh, written by uh, historian Joanne Freeman that talks about the decades in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, where there was so much fighting in Congress, it's a wonder that they got anything done and sometimes they they didn't and it wasn't just philosophical fights it was physical fights it was uh melees uh, and people um, brandishing weapons on the floor of the house and people being caned and duels and um really a turbulent time in our our nation's history it's not much talked about but um it is definitely something that has happened in the past from a legislative standpoint, many of our states are looking at ways to tackle a series of social issues and tax policies and finding ways to survive how the pandemic affected our states and our economies and both the House and the Senate and the legislative branch and in the federal branch are talking about gun violence and about immigration and in some cases border protection and how we address that. And then we have this larger global sense that affects things from the national securities perspective. So of course the you know, we're currently in a ceasefire between the state of Israel and Hamas and funding for that from the United States. There's the ongoing war in Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia um, and there's a question about funding and support for that. There's always a constant struggle with China. The president recently met with 
his counterpart from China and and the economic impacts of that relationship and always a prominence cyber AI crypto. So many of those issues are on the mind of our elected officials as they get into this next legislative session. Of course, jobs in the economy are one of the biggest pieces, and this is where a lot of our um, politics comes from. This is where the electioneering usually happens. It's people focusing on on the economy and how people feel about the economy can reflect how they vote, which leads us into this next set of three. So uh, many people have concerns about the current state of the economy. Uh, COVID obviously affected jobs, the nature of work and government money being injected into the market and how that affected things. Governments tell businesses they needed to, to shut down and we had this whole essential versus non-essential set of workers and we had supply chain issues and all of that is now um, things that we are dealing with repercussions of to include the really high inflation we have and the highest interest rates. But unemployment is really low and our wage increases have outpaced the rise in inflation, but still 81% of people say that they view the economy as poor or fair. Um, US Bank and its um, US economic health checks said that we're somewhere between weak and moderate. Um, so our economic activity is below the long-term average right now, but there's plenty of job openings and wages are increasing, unemployment's low, and so all of that has meant that the labor market is still resilient, but how it affects individuals and individual communities will affect their outlook on elected officials and, and politicians, um, and those elected officials themselves will approach dealing with their counterparts on the floor of the House and Senate state level, federal level, based on the effects of the economy in their communities. And of course, even the, the U.S. Chamber last week um, sent out in their um, action alert that uh, consumers have continued uh, spending and have shown resilience despite their personal savings falling and credit card balances increasing. And the thing that I took from that particularly was the quote, if our elected officials avoid adding uncertainty to the economy, like from a government shutdown, and focus on pro-growth policies that address the worker shortage and help U.S. economies, U.S. companies sell more to international customers, the job market will remain robust, keeping income steady and consumer spending, which I think is really key. Presidential campaign. Um, I live in Iowa, so it is a hotbed for presidential candidates right now, particularly on the Republican side as the caucuses are coming up in early January. And so caucuses and primaries are going to take over um, the focus of national politics at the beginning of the year as we lead into um, the summertime. So the winter and spring will be a lot focused on that. And we're seeing candidates all the time. And I'm sure many people in other early states are seeing the same. Um, it's not lost on folks who are caucus goers um, that one of the folks who are running for president, former President Trump, is facing of civil and criminal trials right now. And so that has played into much of the conversation in terms of uh, caucusing and who to primary for and who to support, who to endorse. Uh, so that has taken up some air in the space of things. And then, of course, we're going to have regular elections in 2024. Um, so our legislative sessions what happens in Congress are all going to be things that are going to build issues and items for people to run on or for people to be targeted because of how they voted for or supported. Um, it also could affect the timing of our legislative sessions. So in some cases, they may get out a lot sooner uh, and want to only move through the essentials so they can get out on the campaign trail or so they can limit the amount of things that they would have to vote on. So I say all that to say that it's not all about us. There's a lot of things that are going to go into to play as we move into 2024 and start to work with some of our elected officials to get things done. But I want to start with civility and it's really important in my mind to get to know and understand people. It's hard to do that in this environment. I talked about the 24 hour news cycle and what that means for people getting their uh, say and for grabbing attention. But I do think it's important to understand 
the people who we interact with, whether or not we agree with them or not. It's really quite possible to understand something or someone without agreeing with them um, on those things or even agreeing that the thing they want to do is correct, but understanding where they're coming from, listening to them and what's their why and how you can meet them where they are is really important. So from a civility standpoint, I hear constantly, why do I always have to be the adult in the room? Or I'm tired of turning the other cheek or it's exhausting to listen to other people. And while all of that might be true, try to think about having these moments where your best day is when you can engage in the best civil uh, interactions. The days that you feel exhausted, you feel tired, it, it might be okay to step away um, and, and take a deep breath or at least remind yourself that there's other people who want to engage and, and you should engage with your best foot forward. And it can be frustrating. I know it uh, definitely frustrating for me when I, I just want to be heard uh, and others aren't listening and and you wonder why the other side might seem like they're being selfish or that they're they're being tone deaf and it's important to remember that when you put yourself in their shoes where they're coming from and think about taking that to be civil with them now you might remember this from the nga i found this to be uh, a really neat tweet from the governor of Utah and it talks about their competition over many things and um, this tweet is a part of the disagree better campaign and I know that we put in the chat earlier about people's um, holiday shopping as they get ready um, between the holiday seasons and um, this video I think speaks to how we interact and talk about um, issues but ways that we can do it civilly because really our civility begins at home and then it extends out into um, the larger professional um, world and so this is going to be really important i think as we start up the 2024 legislative and congressional sessions and so i just want to watch this video with you So I really appreciate that message because I I know many of you have friends uh, across the aisle or different perspectives, or different values, different experiences, whose opinions that you value. And um, even when it comes to government relations, we have those individuals who we need to be able to go to and say, why is this the thing that's being introduced or how is this going to work and and be able to have those those civil dialogues and and so think about as you bring new people into the fold as you meet new individuals who you may not know as well um, try to extend that same courtesy because you'd want that extended to you um, anything about this video stand out to you or struck you in particular you can feel free to throw it in the chat i appreciate the comment from from ryan uh, there as well but please um, if you have thoughts about you know these civil conversations or ways that you engage feel free to share those with with others here so i talked about civility starting at home but i like to think of it this way in terms of how i engage another individual i start first with thinking about 
they're just another human being like me. Um, they're another um, civically minded individual who's also an American. And it makes me think, oh, well, these folks are are just like me. We think differently. We might have different values, but they're the same. They they are engaged. They are keeping up with the issues. They want to be a part of what's happening. And I should give them the same courtesy and respect because they're coming from a different standpoint, um, because I'd want the same thing. And this goes for our elected officials as well. They're still people. Uh, and this is all about building relationships. So try to think about assuming good intentions and giving folks the benefit of the doubt. Um, I know many of your organizations also introduce civility pledges or um, civility statements at the beginning of um, public events or when you have forums or any sort of conversations that might be difficult conversations where you give the opportunity for people to speak freely but also be respectful of one another and i think that that's really important as well as we approach this and in thinking through and thinking about civility i think about two folks in our community in Iowa who really helped us as a community to understand the importance of having these dialogues. And I know many of you uh, have folks in your own communities that you can think of whose organizations are diametrically opposed to each other or somewhere within your state leaders who uh, stand really strongly in their convictions on one side or the other that you could never imagine sitting down and having conversations. So, you know, I want you to keep in mind who those visible rivals are uh, in your community or in your state and imagine them doing what I'm going to show you here. This is a, a video that we're really proud of uh, kind of across our state in the public policy sphere and that highlights the relationship of Donna Red Wing, who is the now deceased uh, former executive director of One Iowa, an LGBT Q rights organization in Iowa, and Bob Vanderplatz, uh, who is um, the CEO of a family leader, which is a um, a Christian um, organization that spends a lot of time focusing on families and on family values. And you may have actually seen recently that Bob uh, made an endorsement in the uh, in the caucuses uh, that are coming up in January, and, and his endorsement, along with the support of his organization, will be a big deal in the Republican caucuses. But this video highlights the unlikely friendship between the two of them, and I want you to to give a second to this and and watch it with me, and then we'll we'll chat about it here in a second.
What did you think about that? Anybody have any any reaction? Yeah, I agree. They were pretty open and candid. I think that that, that part's really important. It's uh, it's hard to get to that point, which is why this is a, a long game. But building that relationship means that you can break down some of those barriers and be a little vulnerable. Yeah, there do need to be more campaigns like this. You're right, Rachel. So, yeah, I think that their their engagement, their example has been one. Um, <laughs> their their example has been one that's been really uh, important to emulate, and I, I think that that is um, is really great. And yeah, Ryan, to your point, the I love the fact that he says that they that changes views, but it changes the approach, uh, which is really that that whole thing and backs up what Donna says about you don't have to hurt each other, right? We can we can disagree as we're supposed to do. Politics exists for us to be able to um, work through our problems, but it's not about tearing the other person down, um, and so. I find that to be really good. Feel free to use that uh, video as an example, but I know we can all think about people in our own communities who would fit the bill of like, man, if we could put those two together, then anybody could, could be together. So you as a community leader, your organization really can serve that role if you don't already as the, the convener for strengthening our democracy through these civil conversations, through bringing people together who might have um, different values, different systems of approach, different ways of thinking about a problem and bringing them all to the table because you're the trusted resource um, and really start to move the needle on how we approach talking to each other in the civil discourse in our country. You may have also seen this year, even back this summer, uh, 13 of our presidential centers. So, you know, the presidential libraries came together and said, we need to focus more on um, on being active and not passive and talking about civility and in our politics and we all need to be that way and we need to engage each other um, across the aisle uh, and that's one of the reasons that today i'm in lawrence kansas i'm uh, sitting uh, right now in the elizabeth dole reading room in the robert j dole institute of politics um, the the relationship between tom harkin who you heard i worked for and bob dole was really immense um, and after my time working for Senator Harkin and then leading the Harkin Institute, I now left there and in my spare time, I'm on the board of the Dole Institute, uh, which is something I never would have thought about when I was a younger politico, but now it's something I couldn't imagine not being a part of because I understand and many of us around this, this building understand the importance of building those relationships and having those dialogues and understanding that just because someone has a different letter behind their name doesn't mean that they can't come up with good public policy as well that we can support. So I think all of us can Think about ways that we can dial back the rhetoric and bring down our, our heavy handed approaches and our tone to better engage people across the aisle. So with that, I want to move on to talking about some of those key takeaways. These are the the reminder section for you as we get ready for 2024 um, for many of you who had uh, Institute classes. IOM classes recently or even years, years ago. Um, this is a reminder for you, but this is also a reminder for you to engage with your leadership and with your board and with your members uh, or with your bosses, whoever it might be, uh, because sometimes it's reminding that wide swath of people how this is going to work uh, and giving them reassurance that it's not going to be instantaneous and it's not always easy, but you know what's happening. You're engaged and we're in it for the long run. So the first thing is to practice your elevator pitch. I want you to always take your time and when you're having conversations with your elected officials, but also be succinct because there's a lot of part of those conversations. There are a lot of people who want to talk to their elected officials and, and they're hearing from a lot of people every day. So have your portion um, succinct and think about, um, for those of you who've been in my classes, I'll talk about those six word why or the six word reason. So think about your why. Think about how you can really quickly, very easily explain why you're there and why what you're talking about is important. The second is the first time you meet someone, you shouldn't be asking for something, whether that's passing a bill or asking for money. Um, this falls into number three, which is this is a long game. So 
this is a series of introduction, getting to know, explaining, working through the process of educating, advocating, and then lobbying as you work with your elected officials. Think about it this way. If a stranger comes up to you on the street and asks you for $10, what's the likelihood that you're going to give that stranger who you've never met $10? Um, I, I think that if we think about approaching our elected officials that way, many times we're approaching people who we've never chatted with before, and they're this list of things that we want. Um, it can be a turnoff, but it also doesn't really help with building their relationship. As I said, this is the long game, and so changes can take a lot of time. And so you're building long term relationships, not only with the elected officials, but also with their staff and, and with others. Know your plan of attack. Um, this is having a plan A, a plan B. What happens if plan A and plan B blow up or what happens if plan B is what you end up talking about and you forget about plan A? All of this is important to to game and walk through prior to the session starting uh, just so you can have a general sense. You can have the best plan in the world that will not work on day two, but you want to have a general sense of where things might go and how it might play out. Also, it's important to remember in your plans of attack where you want to make the, the change or where the influence can be. It's not always legislation. Sometimes it's judicial. Sometimes it's working with the executive branch. Um, and so knowing where your impacts might be and what the best timing of that might be is really important. It's also important to know that if you're looking to do things from a government relations standpoint, there's always something to be done at your local, state, or federal level in all three, or at least on the local and state level, all three levels and branches of the government. So there are things that you can think of. There's activities, there's ways that you can engage at all times. Um, and so never feel like your only time is a legislative session or beginning of Congress. Know what issues uh, matter to your constituents uh, you do that through fact finding and collecting data, of course, but you also do it by having the ability to bring people together and, and put together your own agendas. And understanding others is really important too, because you want to figure out what other groups, what other entities, what other constituencies have mutual issues to mine, um, and what other entities might have divergent issues from mine, and how might that affect things. And knowing what matters to other people's constituents is really important too, because your issue might not be supported by everyone that's at a committee or everyone who is in that chamber. And so understanding that and understanding why that might be is really important. Or what happens if the person who chairs the committee you need legislation done represents a district that will be adversely affected by the thing that you want? You should know that ahead of time. Feel that out so you can understand how you might approach having those conversations with that person. Your word's really important. Um, and as a person doing government relations, it might be the most important thing. This is all you have in many cases. I've always found it really important for people to say, I don't know when they really don't know the answer for something, but I'll follow up or I'll go get that information for you. Never make anything up. Um, it's really important to build that trust by saying, here is the fact based information. Here are the things that we know. I can get you the other information that you you might need. One of the things that you're doing in your government relations program is becoming that resource. You want to be one of the last people they call to make sure that what they're about to vote on when it comes to your issues is something that you've given them full range of information on. You've given them your full perspective and told them why they should or shouldn't support it. You want to be on that that call list. Uh, and as a former staffer, that was one of the things I, I made sure I did. I wanted to make sure I called our key folks back in the state before we took a vote, just so I made sure we're on the right page, or at least we're going in with both eyes wide open as we approach something. Um, also, as a former staffer, I will say to you that um, staffers are sometimes the best messengers. Um, many times when you're building the relationship with the elected officials, you should simultaneously think about building that relationship with the staffers. Uh, these are the people who are gonna be working in those issues for years to come, but they're also the people who 
are going to be the last to talk to the boss before they vote on something. Um, and that might be in caucus, the legislative um, level, or it might be the actual physical walk from the Senate office building through the tunnels over to the Senate floor. And that's the reminder. That's the conversation. That's the last person the member talks to before they go onto the floor to vote. And my very best days in the Senate, that would be seven minutes a time. Um, and that's how much time I would have to remind the boss of having this conversation with you months prior, what the bill does and how my recommendation or my team's recommendation of vote will go. And then they go off to the floor to vote. So building that relationship with the staff is just as important uh, and vital to your government relations work as the elected official. And then also keep it simple. Uh, I always like to advocate one pagers um, and that gives enough information for the member or for the staff person to have the key highlights and then they can come back to you if they want to go further in depth or they can come back to you if they want to sit down and have more um, information brought to them and, and gone through more deeply. I also say this because this is a good time when you start to build these relationships or you continue to build the relationships to know how your members and your staffers would like to be communicated with. Um, sometimes they want to get emails from you. Sometimes they want to do uh, a sign up for their newsletter. Sometimes they might want you to visit with them you know, during recess. I know that I really only wanted to have hard copy one pagers um, and I could then use that as my reference points in my binders and then go back and get the more in-depth conversations accomplished during the recess or perhaps when I know that the legislation is getting closer. So ask them, ask them how they want to be communicated with. Um, that can go a long way as well. Now, here are a few of the things that I want to challenge you to. And there's four challenges. You can take all four and let me know how you do at the end of 2024. Um, one is figure out your why. What is your why? Why do you do what you do? Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're ever in my, my IOM class, I talk about the six word why. Uh, but think about the things that come to mind when you think of your values as an organization, why you do the work you do and why it's important. And understand that, really drill down and know your purpose, know your why. Second is a little bit of a harder challenge. Um, in talking about civility, oftentimes some of the conversations we have are uncivil because of information bias or confirmation bias. We have this self-selection for information, just like we have self-selection for the groups of people we like to live around. And so my challenge to you is to try for a week or a month or even the whole year to listen or watch or engage news and information in a different way. So if you do it, only on social media or mostly on social media, add in or switch out watching TV or reading print or the exact opposite. If you're the, the TV or the print person, try picking up your news on social media. Think about you know, what it would be like to engage in that way. And then also the opposite end. Think if you listen to or watch news that you would consider somewhere in the middle or neutral-ish. Um, think about picking up news on the right or the left, that you can scan the same story across more than one source. Or if you watch or listen to news that could be seen as left-leaning, try starting to engage more on the right. And then think about the people who only use that one source as their source of information uh, and how that might somehow affect your interactions with someone who who does that. And so I remember when I worked in the Senate, I would start my day with Fox and Friends. I would end my day with MSNBC. And in the middle, I would watch local news and CNN and then read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and Al Jazeera and try to get a full perspective of all these different information sources and how I might uh, understand the folks that I'm engaging with based on understanding where they're getting their news from, but also how they are talking to those outlets. That was really important to me. So I challenge you to think about doing that. The third is 
try to grow or build an advocacy committee. Um, and I know many of you in your organizations already have an advocacy committee that comes together to build agendas, but think about growing that apparatus uh, if you already have one. And include folks that you might not necessarily think about including, whether it be on an ad hoc basis or um, a permanent space where you can bring in an unusual suspect, as I like to call them. So someone or some entity that might not necessarily be seen as a group that goes hand in hand with your organization, but who could have the same or a level of interest in the same issue as you? And so what a powerful message that would send if you have people at the table as part of the conversation who are not necessarily folks who would be seen as completely in line with you. So growing and building your advocacy committee. And then lastly, I would say is find someone to share and throw out ideas to you to uh, get challenges from you can ask tough questions to in a non-judgmental and trustworthy environment um, so sort of like the bob and donna conversation we saw earlier um, i have multiple friends who i have as my go-to as the person the people that i want to talk to about these issues as we are entering contentious times in a legislative session you know why did it come out this way or what's the impetus behind this or what are you really trying to affect or just Having someone with a different background, different experience, different point of view who is in your corner um, can be really pivotal. So if you don't have that already, try to find someone and build that relationship where you can get to that point where you can ask each other the tough questions and talk about the politics. Um, and if you do already have someone, continue to grow that relationship or maybe add another individual to your list. When we talk about relationship building, it's important to think about it in the context of when, where, why, and how. So thinking about it, it's advocacy is a year round relationship building exercise. And it's sometimes most effective when they're not in the heat of a legislative session or when Congress isn't on. So think about your when and how you might approach them. Where? So be available and accessible within reason, but you want to be that resource. Like I said earlier, you want to be that phone call. You want to be the person they want to talk to and meet with um, before they make major decisions. So being available to them where you can either at the Capitol or by phone or going out to their districts and meeting them all really important to that. How? Think about how you communicate with them. Remember to ask them how they want to be communicated with. And so you can communicate with them according to their preferences and not your own. Um, and that'll go a long way. The why is all about tying it to their district and their constituents, uh, how it might affect them, what the important thing is, but also being honest about how it might affect others within their constituency as well, because one of the questions that you often get asked is, OK, yes, this group supports it, but who doesn't support it? Um, and knowing that, being aware of that uh, is helpful and also impressive to the elected official. And then I put appreciate in the middle. Show that appreciation. Tell them when they're doing things that are going well and the things that you like, just like when we like to tell them that they're doing things that we don't like or we want to criticize. So showing that appreciation for someone who has raised their hand and said, I would like to go and represent you in this body. Um, showing them that appreciation for the work they're doing is, is really important too. And I try my best to always begin and end with that appreciation. So year round session, accessible and available, communicating to them with their preferences and thinking about their constituencies. Now, this is the point where I want you to think about some of your own relationship building ideas. And over the years, I've collected many of these things that organizations do to continue to grow close ties between their organization and the elected official or their staff. Organization 101s are, are really good ways of doing this. Um, usually outside of a, a session, having people come to your organization um, and talking them through what it is that you do, uh, explaining what the impact is, giving them the most up-to-date data and statistics on your organization and, and what the work is that you do, giving them 
a sense of who the people are who are part of it, giving them tours, um, whether it be of your your member organizations or if there's a new factory in town or if there's a new business that they should see um, is a good way to get them out into their state and district to uh, engage with their constituents, but also connect your members with them. Um, I always like to say this is a good thing to do with the district and state staff as well, because as you build those relationships, it gives them something to do with their member when that person comes back to to town to say, hey, let's go out to this new plant or let's go out to this expansion. Uh, where they're going to bring in, you know, 40 new jobs. You know, this is something I can build on our agenda for our tours. And so it's a mutual um, relationship building exercise here. Staffer lunches. Um, I know many organizations, even when I worked for the Greater Des Moines Partnership, we would do um, kind of a reverse fly-in. So we would bring um, the DC staffers along to Des Moines, along with meeting up with the staffers who worked in the state with the governor staff and folks in the legislature all to to visit and we would give them tours. We would have a big lunch and have conversations about our policy issues and some of the major projects we're working on. You can also do the same thing with elected officials for lunches to introduce your policy agendas. Um, and if any of you have other thoughts or ideas or things that you do that work well, please put those in the chat for others to see. Um, in those panel discussions where we can talk about uh, issues or the things that are going to be on our legislative agenda and have people from both parties represented, both chambers represented, um, sit and discuss how the agenda of the organization matches up with the agenda of their caucus or them individually. Um, appreciation picnics can be a part of that. Um, having them on your podcast or introducing them through um, your newsletter or having them write a simple, you know, two or three paragraphs about what they've been up to. I know many organizations also do uh, scorecards and talk about how they can build their score with your organization and doing candidate forums. So uh, allowing your members the opportunity to meet with them uh, and ask them questions prior to an election uh, is really important. And it goes a long way also into building that relationship from the time they're a candidate to the most senior member um, and seasoned member of the legislature or of Congress. And then, of course, the fly-ins both to D.C. Uh, and also the the Capitol Hill days in your state legislatures are also good ways to build those relationships. But you have to find the ones that are best for you. You have to do the activities that are best for you in order to um, to build that relationship and take full advantage of the membership's uh, ability to engage their elected officials. So. I'm going to conclude there. That's my uh, my spiel for kind of our prep for 2024 and the things that we should all be thinking about and, and getting ourselves psyched up for as legislatures begin to come back and we get ready to start a election cycle and Congress will gavel back in. Excellent. Well, Joseph, thank you so much. And I know you left an open ended question there for people to drop in the chat. And I, I do invite everyone to um, to share if you'd like in the comments. Um, the specific relationship building ideas that have worked well for you. Um, I know it's always, you know, it's nice to hear from other people what has worked for them. Um, so we've left a couple minutes here at the end for any questions. So if you would like to drop in the chat your questions, um, we'll go ahead and and get those answered. We did, did leave a couple minutes here um, for that. So um, we invite you to, to ask any questions you have here in the chat. Um, I'd say um, Joseph is a great resource, a great faculty member to have with us and does an incredible job in teaching on this topic. A, a great wealth of experience as we've seen today. Um, and thank you so much for, for your time today. I do want to leave time for um, questions that anybody may have. So we'll we'll give it a minute um, here in the chat. Or if you'd like to just drop in relationship building ideas that have worked for you if you don't have any questions. Yeah. So it looks like we have one coming in couple coming in yeah uh, okay wearing your elected official hat can you speak to your own experiences of encounters with constituents and how civility or the lack thereof colors those well i can definitely say as a local elected official um just like being a legislator i would say you get um immediately recognized in the most uh, interesting places, usually like the grocery store or the gas station, uh, and people will stop you and ask you questions. And 
And I don't mind that. I typically, you know, love seeing my neighbors and, and chatting with them. I think the um, the negative approach is always the one that throws me off. Like when I get an email that says, well, what did you idiots do? Or how stupid can you be? Um, those typically don't get a, a very quick response from me. Uh, I, I think when people, you know, are passionate, that's that's really important. And I don't discount that. But I, I definitely appreciate the approach of, hey, can you help me understand why you did what you did? Or can we figure out a way to solve a problem? Uh, those approaches work so much better with me because like being confronted in such a negative way makes me think that you're not looking to find a solution, that you're just angry and we need to find a different day to engage. Um, Rachel's question is, do you have any ideas or advice for regional organizations? I currently work for a chamber association that covers nearly half of Ohio and struggling with ways to scale up my ideas that came with my me from my last local chamber. Well, I think one of the things that uh, we did at the, the Greater Des Moines Partnership, which works on a, a multi-county region, um, was to make sure that we engaged each of our individual chambers. And I'm not sure if you have that sort of breakdown, Rachel, where we had local chambers that would still do, say, school board uh, engagements or city engagements. And then as the partnership, 137 chambers in 41 counties, perfect. Um, and so we kind of divided and conquered how we approach certain things. And so the congressional engagement would be done by us, but the, the local engagement was mostly done by the local chambers but we would help support the forums and we would help support the um everyone with coming on the fly in and we would all engage together on doing the welcome session for um the legislature when they came back to des moines for uh, their first night reception um and but it, it definitely took some time to get to that point because the the organization was formed fairly recently in the last 20 years. And so having those individual chambers then say, we're gonna funnel up and allow advocacy from the larger umbrella and economic development from the larger umbrella, and we'll still take these individual things. But you and I might wanna talk uh, separately about some of those concrete things that we did and, and how they still are, um, are useful. Be happy to do that. Excellent. What other questions do you have? Yeah, well, other, and and I would definitely, you know, I'm sure Joseph. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn when I say, um, if you do have questions, certainly reach out to him individually. I know that, um, you know, he's a great resource. Yeah, um, yeah, happy to chat questions. with folks and yeah. talk through individual uh, questions you might have, or give you some ideas of what we, what we've done in different organizations that I've been a part of. Sounds like we have a little bit of a quiet bunch today. <laughs> That's okay. Has uh, yeah. this been helpful to you? Has any of this been useful? Otherwise, I can burn this PowerPoint. <laughs> no, I I know I certainly um, appreciated the 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 heavy focus on civility and disagreeing better. I really liked that that segment. Um, I think it's very useful at a time like this um, where we are. So I know I got something out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that said, it sounds like there may not be any questions. Again, if you do, feel free to reach out separately. Um, but thank you all for joining today. And then just as a reminder, again, um, Institute is a CAECC approved provider. So if you would like to receive the credit, go ahead and email the IOM inbox. And thank you again, Joseph, so much for your time today. You're very welcome. And uh, the PowerPoint's available out there mm -hmm. along with that um, a document that has a little bit of my, um, you know, things that I've discussed too. So, but yeah, feel free to reach out with any any questions and I look forward to seeing folks in the summertime as CC lets me come back and teach. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you and thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye.